All right, so we're recording. I'm just starting the same way. I'm Mr. Streb. I am the content enrichment specialist for NUR265 and the rest of the advanced med surges throughout Galen, um, including the BSM program, but we won't get into all that right now. All right. All right, so we're going to get started. Your, your syllabus um, is where I've got this information from. It says that we're going to cover chapter 23 in these pages, 460 to 467. It's basically just going to be burned. So if you have questions about what the skin does and the rest of it, please go back and read. I'm still going to start up here on the top like I always do. Even though we're not going to talk about the rest of the skin, I want you to understand what this chapter is really asking us to do. It's saying with anything related to skin, we have to be cognizant of skin integrity and what skin integrity means. It, it keeps out infections. It, it helps regulate body temperature. It helps with fluid and electrolytes and gas exchange. All of that is, is impacted. And then pain because there's a lot of nerve endings in our um you know, integumentary, especially in the skin. So we're going to look at that. When it talks about tissue integrity, this chapter mentions pressure injuries, but we're going to get into burns. So either way, it's going to mess with your tissue, tissue integrity. And gas exchange and fluid electrolyte balances are two major components that are interrelated to anything related to the integumentary system. So I just want to put that out there because a lot of what we're going to do as nurses and what we're going to be monitoring for is based on these little items here. So when you read the book with that kind of intention, it just makes it easier to understand what the author is trying to get you to understand. So let me just scroll on down past all the stuff you did in either 170 if you're a straight ADM program or if you're um, when you're in 242 in the bridge program. You've covered some of this already. All right. So we're getting down here to where we need to start at. I keep saying that because we're not there yet. Oh, my Lord. We keep going, don't we? There we go. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to talk about is burns. Um, the 10th edition is not remotely even as in depth as the 9th edition. But what I, I mean, yeah, but what I've seen in the 10th edition is it's saying these are patients who are going to be in an acute care area. What the other edition did was really put you like in the ICU or a burn center because a lot of burn patients, especially if they have more than 10% of their body burn, um, anything on the chest or face, they automatically go to a burn center. So, what's the point in having brand new nurses learn all of this? The answer is there's not one. You're probably not going to see real burn patients wherever you work until you get later on. But so if we're looking at this. I want you to think about what the skin does, uh, how skin, uh, how tissue integrity. It, it really helps with that invasive uh, microbial invasions from any kind of any kind of uh, exposure to bacteria or anything at all. And like I said, it helps with the temperature. It also helps with vitamin D. It also helps with these, these electrolytes and fluids, so much so that I want to put over here, and, and I, I, I kind of do this myself because there's more I know, is when you think about when somebody gets burned and what happens with the shift, when somebody gets burned in their skin, there's a fluid release, right? Your body sends all those white blood cells to the surface so it can start fighting off any invasions and to help reduce just kind of whatever, but it, it increases inflammation. So we know that hyponatremia happens all the time in these patients because that sodium gets trapped in the edematous fluid. Um, when the plasma starts to leak, that's what happens. Also hyperkalemia, because that, there's that distribution in the, uh, in the sodium pump. And I put the notes over here. I got this from a different book, but I just want you to understand when you start destroying red blood cells and you start destroying um, a tissue, you get that uh, hemolysis it is going to cause you to have hyperkalemia. All of that kind of goes together. So these patients are now at risk for hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, meaning you should kind of look for those, those values. The other book did a good job of explaining it. I don't know how in depth your teachers went over any of that in your class, but it is something to consider because the book talks about fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So we kind of need to think about those. I don't think any of you at this point in the game have any question on what the epidermis is as opposed to the dermis and then the subcutaneous tissue. But when we're in, I don't think they're going to make you look at pictures. I know they're not and make you figure out if it's a superficial burn or a partial burn or a deep, uh, a deep partial burn or a full thickness. They're kind of self-explanatory. On a test, the deeper, the deeper thickness the burn is, just the worse it's going to be. There's more tissue involvement. There, there's more uh, chance for infection. It's going, to, it's going to screw up your compensatory mechanisms. You're going to be hypothermic. You're going to be um, you know, just, just all of these issues are going to occur. So I think what the new book is really trying to say is, is it's not near as important as it used to be to, to know all this. And I don't mean that negatively because it is important. I teach 
an advanced burns life support class at SAMC, which is a level one trauma center in the burn center here in San Antonio. So, man, I have a whole book. We can spend three days on just talking about burns, but you guys don't work in a burn center. So what's the point? You're not in war in the theater. You're not even an EMT out there where you might put on, on, on a, on a uh, you know, a vehicle burn or something like that. But it is important. I do want you to think about the rules of nine. Um, what did your teacher say in class about the rules of nine that you were going to be calculating those in the exam? Yeah, yes. doing the rules of nine and then doing the Parkland formula. Parkland formula. Yep. Exactly. So when I'm thinking about the rules of nine, why does it matter? You're just trying to calculate total body surface area because you're going to use that to determine if the patient needs to be sent to a trauma center, you know, a, a, I mean, a burn center, um, ICU, whatever you have available. And then also um, how you're going to replace the fluid. It depends on the, the percentage of body surface area burn. So we're going to look at that shortly. Um, I like to think about this. When you get a burn, think about patients when they have these higher levels, these higher total body surface area percentages. And when they have uh, greater depths of burns, like the partial and the full thickness burns, it puts them at risk for distributive shock. We're not in distributive shock yet, but we're going to in the next chapter, right? As part of this whole thing, they really tie together. When you think about distributive, it means you don't have enough distribution of fluid. What happens in a burn? You start the third space. So your vascular uh, volume goes down and you're not going to be able to perfuse. So you will in turn go into distributive shock. So we'll get there later. I would just be remiss not to mention that while I'm thinking here. Um, I like to think about this kind of stuff. When I'm looking at burn classifications, make sure you can look at the body. Not really the body. We're not going to ever give you a picture of the body and say, what's the percentage? We're going to say, hey, the patient was burned. I just got some examples. Burns to the anterior and posterior surface of the left and right upper extremities. That's very, that's very specific, right? The left and right upper extremities. That means arms. So 9%, 9%. That's 18 already. So let's go, let's look and see what it says. I just, I found this in, in, a, in an example. And the posterior surface of the torso, we know the posterior surface is 18. So what's 18 and 18? 30, I'm saying the 36. Now, anterior posterior, right? So we got the whole nine. 18, the whole nine. 18, 18, yeah. So yeah. it looks like that's 18 times three, no? Yeah, so that's what I would go with, which is 54, right? Somewhere on there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So as long as you can calculate that, it makes you kind of think of what's going on because you're going to have to plug that formula into the Parkland formulator. And I'm going to show what that looks like. I'll explain it as we move on. Just want you to be aware of kind of where we're at. So if you don't know this already from your previous class, go back and learn it however you can learn it. Um, so let's kind of move on. When we think about the skin thicknesses, I, I know we talked about it a little bit, but I want to talk about the older adult because older adults always show up. Why? because they're more susceptible to burns, right? They have thinner skin, they have decreased sensation, they might hold on to something longer like a hot pot, they might put their feet in hot water and not realize it's so hot because of diabetes or any other kind they of have, sensation. Right, check. core morbidities, right. Yeah, so all of these become very, what? Nursing things, because that's what we do. When you understand what we're doing here in nursing school is to have you be a nurse. When you walk into a patient's room, you have to think, ah, older patient, comorbidities, they're at higher risk for burns. I need to make sure I educate. All of that really becomes what your job is. So think about older adults and lower temperatures. And we'll talk about like setting the, um, the water temperature less than 120, all that, because it really, you can get skull burns, especially if you have children, like I said, the older aging population. Um, when we think about that full thickness burn and the tissue destruction, what I want you to understand is that local and systemic problems affecting your fluid and electrolytes, because that's when you start getting the shifts in your electrolyte balances. But more importantly, and we're not getting there yet, metabolic changes, your endocrine changes, think about kidneys, respiratory, cardiac, because what happens? What did I just say? When you get burned, you can All go the into fluids. like distributor yeah. shock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shock. It's like it's shunting. Shock. Shock. Yeah. Yes, it's called shunting. There's a, I even highlight that in the book down where it talks about shunting. I'm like you. It's those big pictures. It doesn't matter what causes shock, y'all. Shock always leads to the same thing, a, an underperfusion of your organs to include your kidneys and your lungs and your heart and your brain and everything else. So all of that matters. All right, let's move on down. So there are different types of burns, and I know you know this, and each burn has its own kind of you know, nuance, if you will. And we're going to talk about all of them, the electrical burns, radiation, smoke-related, thermal, they're all kind of the same, but 
Well, I want to differentiate just a couple things. When you get a chemical burn, you think about the house, it could be an acid or a base. I'll show you some of those as we progress. I'm just trying to get your mind to think not all burns are the same, right? Certain things you get on your body, if you don't get it off your skin, it just keeps burning. Um, if you get one of those thermal burns, like I used to do roofing before I joined the Navy. That's why I joined the Navy, because that was the most miserable job I ever did. In Arkansas, on a hot roof in the middle of October, I mean, August. Oh, my God. Yeah, you know. So I've done roof and I burned oh, my hand using that hot tar. Yes, yeah, miserable. And when it gets on your hand, it don't stop burning. It just keeps burning straight through. So, yeah, there are different kinds of burns and they're not all the same, but they all cause the same type of injury, which is the burn injury. It just depends on what we're looking at. So depending on what kind of burn they might present to you on the test, right? When I say test, I mean just life. Every patient's room you walk into is literally a test. What do I do first? What is the priority intervention? A shift change. What is my priority patient? So when I say test, I mean that this test you're going to take on next week, as well as the test you're going to take when you go to ATI, NCLEX, and your patient's room. So look for that history. If you get an electrical burn, what do you think automatically? Yes, there's a burn. Cool. But every burn is a burn. But what else comes to mind when you think electrical burn? The damage in between the skin and, and the right. between the open and exit wound. Yep. And what kills you the fastest every single time? Airway, breathing, cardiac. Yep. So yeah. what does electrical burn? I say over here, initial assessment has to include the heart rate, getting EKGs, checking that rhythm. Our job as a nurse in these burns, we're not going to fix the burns, y'all. That's not our job. We're not going to do any of the escarotomies. We're not going to scrub them down. We are going to look for signs and symptoms that let us know, oh, this is problematic. They got to go to the ICU. We're trying not to kill somebody's loved one. That's how I do my job every single time I walk into a room. How do I not kill you? How do I make sure you don't die on me because I don't miss something? When I think of it that way, I start looking. So an electrical burn, I like what your book says, the iceberg effect. You only see what you see. You have no idea internally what got cooked. And I mean that, like we cook organs all the time when they come in from grabbing electric wires. And a lot of them never make it out because it just ruins their, their organs. So we know that the longer you, the electricity and the higher voltage, the greater damage. I'm just going to move on from there, but I really wanted to put that out there for you to understand and then I'm not done yet. I'm going to I'm look at these pictures in a minute. The way your book is set up. Radiation burns, that's more like x-ray or, or the sun, you know, put on, minimize the exposure. Smoke related is something I really want you to be cognizant of. Because once again, what kills you the fastest? Is it the shift of fluid? Is it the infection? Probably not. Airway. Airway, breathing, circulation. So with an electrical burn, we think heart rate, EKGs. With smoke inhalation, what your biggest thing is going to be is looking for signs and symptoms that clue you in that this patient might have been on some kind of smoke inhalation or some kind of house fire, some kind of car fire. So I think of any patient who is in a trauma, like if you're a burn patient, you're already a trauma patient as well. So we kind of relate those. So on a, I'm a level one trauma guy all my life, right? So when you're in a car wreck and it catches on fire, what are we looking for? What gives me signs and symptoms that your minor burn might be problematic and be inhalation burns to your airway? What, what, what are we looking out for? Uh, nasal flaring, some soot to your face. Yeah. Um, yeah, nasal, the, the, the hair being singed from your face. Yeah, because yeah. it's the a mustache, closed space. Eyelashes, no hair, mm -hmm. nose hair. Any kind of hair on your face that is singed is a pretty good indicator that you might've burned your airway. But look for that shortness of breath, any kind of coughing, hoarseness. Man, because what we know is this, when you get uh, that inflammatory response to your throat, which happens within hours, that is going to occlude your airway and we will never be able to intubate you. So when we start noticing these, these signs and symptoms, that's when we have to really start thinking about intubating. Call, that, call the physician, call that rapid response, get the ICU people down there so they can intubate this patient immediately. I always say over here, look for these red cherry uh, color of the oral mucosa as well as the, as the face. A little further, it talks about that, but facial burns. I mean, we, I, I'm also talking about carbon monoxide poisoning because that can also cause that, that cherry colored face, right? Carbon monoxide does what? It adheres to the hemoglobin. So it pushes oxygen off of the hemoglobin. And while your SpO2 might say 94%, you're like, why is my patient not, they look like they ain't breathing. They're not perfusing correctly. They're, they're rapidly breathing. Uh, all of this stuff ain't making sense. If they're a burn patient, the SpO2 is not going to matter because it's going to register that the blood's saturated. It just doesn't know that it's carbon monoxide or if it's O2. 
So look for that red color face and stuff. These are just things that always pop up on patients. So NCLEX cares. And that means Galen cares and any other college cares. Thermal burns, I think we all know about thermal burns. It don't matter if it's dry, if it's, if it's a steam burn. We know that those scaldings are, are worse, but y'all know what we're going to do with that. We'll move on from there. And then contact burns, like we said, something really hot, metal, tar, whatever. It's just problematic. All right, y'all, there's a lot in this chapter, and there's not a lot in this chapter. It's a lot of words, and you're like, oh, boy, a lot of reading. Am I going to ask you what the, are they going to ask you the characteristics of burns on your exam? I, I doubt it. Um, it's not often that you have to differentiate between a partial thickness and a full thickness. When they come into the hospital, they're going to tell you what it is. Patient presents with full thickness burns, you know, blah, blah, blah. What, what we really need to think about, and I, and, and I put notes over here when I think about it, is when we get to these partial and these full thickness burns. Your book says any major burns. What do we do? Patients who meet any of the criteria over here have to go to an ICU, emerge, like an emergency department, ICU, if that's all they have available, the emergency department first, if you're an EMT, and then they have to go to a burn center once they're stabilized. So they might be in the ICU for a minute, but as soon as we can transfer them to a burn center, they have to. And it's not a lot, partial thickness burns to anything greater than 10%. So if you have a patient, a test question that says your, your patient's got a TBSA of 40%, y'all, that's already a major burn. There's nothing more you have to think about. If they have it to their feet or their hands or their genitalia or any major joints, why? Because if you lose your hands and feet and your penis, or if you lose your ability to move your hands, you can't walk, you can't function, you can't reproduce. Those are things that we want to save. So we think about life and limb. This is truly a case when you get hand burns, especially if they're circumferential, meaning that you get burns that go all the way around your arm, right? What happens when it swells? It causes pressure. What happens if you got a burn all the way around your arm? What's it pressing on? What's it causing? Look at my hand. What do I cause? It? Oh, yeah. It's a causing constriction. Yeah, it's a tourniquet, basically. We call that yeah. a compartment syndrome, right? And so your book doesn't go into it anymore. But back in the day, if your book talked about if you had like, I, I'm, a, I'm a military guy. So when we're in theater and somebody gets blown up and they get burned to their chest, they have to get on a helicopter and get flown out of there. We do, you know, fasciotomies or escarotomies. If there's like burnt tissue, you would cut all the way down and cut straight across. It allows the chest to expand. We do it on arms as well. Where they'll cut, you know, they'll cut down the fingers. They'll cut down the arms to relieve that pressure. That's called an escarotomy. Um, so I don't know if your book, your book doesn't really talk about it anymore, but we've, the syllabus hasn't changed a lot. So I'm going to mention it anyway, because I know it's something that we've talked about heavily. And that's just the kind of guy I am. So be aware of that. Any kind of electrical burn, ah, any kind of chemical burn, any inhalation burns, three, third degree burns. Um, these are the kinds of patients that have to be sent out. So don't, don't miss that, right? I, that, those are safety concerns. So make sure you understand those. You know, I didn't go back and look at these pictures. I just want you to see them real quick, not because we need to be able to identify them, but I want you to see what happens when you get burned. It starts to swell, right? Th that is a big thing. Um, you can start seeing the swelling and look at that finger. It'll get so tight in there and so much pressure that you might lose circulation to your fingers. And we see a lot of necrotic fingertips if they don't go in there and do one of the escarotomies. I think I even put that over here as well, just because I want to make sure I've mentioned it. What happens if you get burns, especially to the hands and the arms? Well, think about circumferential burns. Think about how it can cause that compartment syndrome. How would you know it's causing a compartment syndrome? What would be absent? Pulses. Do you have equal bilateral pulses? Are they bounding or are they weak and thready? Weak and thready always lets you know there's not good blood flow. Bounding, okay, we got good blood flow. We might be hyper, hypertensive or we might be in fluid volume overload if they're bounding, but it's usually a good indication that we have something going on. So I just want to put those out there for you. I'm like a degloving on that one. But burns are something crazy, man. I'm just letting y'all know. If you've never seen them in real life, they are quite traumatic to look at. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of go down and keep moving on from there and just get down on some other stuff. Um, the last part, and I mentioned this earlier, is some of the acid and alkalines. I don't think they're going to be on your exam for a lot of reasons. But if you have acids, those are the things that kids can get into. My friend that gave, uh, he, as a two or three-year-old, drank pool cleaner. His dad owned a pool cleaning business. He has no stomach. His esophagus had to be rebuilt. Like it is, it literally just, he's can't, he has no nutrients. He has to eat nonstop and drink and sure because he doesn't have a gut anymore, right? 
So these things really matter. We have to think about uh, safety and keeping things locked up and keeping them out. As a nurse on ATI, on NCLEX in real life, that's part of the teaching we're gonna do. So I, I'd be remiss not to mention that as well. So be very aware, acids cause continual burning. These alkalines, like some of the oven cleaners and stuff, if they get on you, they, they can cause skin irritants and, and they can cause your proteins to liquefy. So it's an even worse burn because it causes changes. Like I said, we're not gonna get into that. Surely I, I doubt it very seriously, but if you ever encounter some of these, get the contamination off. If you have clothes on, remove the clothes. If it's a powder, you know, brush it off. If it's, if it's some kind of other stuff, copious amounts of water and try to flush it off. We can move on from that. All right. So health promotion, this is what I was telling you earlier. When you think about patients, how do we prevent burns? Think about assessing the water temperature. Actually get a thermometer. Don't, you know, what, what part of your body do you use if you check? Like the back of your arm, back here, somewhere that's very sensitive, right? Not your foot, not your hand. Something that's not exposed to temperature very often. So when you feel it, hot water heaters below 120. I don't know what's on your exam ever. ATI is here as well. Make sure you understand that. Make just, just the basics, you know that. Never smoke with oxygen. I mean, at this point in the game, I know you know that, but still a lot of folks don't. Make sure you keep your, 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 your um, fireplace closed, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I know it sounds silly, but I mean, look at these kind of questions. These are real kind of nursing questions you could get on any kind of exam. And they all sound very familiar. Have a smoke detector in one central location of the house. In your mind, you're like, sure, no, they need to be everywhere. Each bathroom needs to have one um, near the fireplace where your kids are. So a lot of these kind of answers, if you use home oxygen, turn it down while you're smoking. Uh, no, nope, turn it off, right? Set your water temperature below 160. You will burn the crap out of yourself. It's got to be below 120. So I'm not saying you have to memorize all this. Just be aware that these kind of things do pop up. All right. I've already talked about carbon monoxide poisoning when I was talking about burns. But just be aware of that. Be aware that carbon monoxide does cause that changes in your, your, your mucosa, your, your red colored face. I just got to keep putting that out there because I know it's just one of those things I want you to be aware of. Um, and make sure you have different planned escape routes regardless where you're at because those things are important as well. All right. What else? What else? What else? What else? Older population. Always read your boxes. These QSIM boxes are never bad because why? Safety is the name of the game. Look at every question you get on your exam. I, I encourage you to think about it when you're taking your exam. Like, oh, is this safety related? Oh, is this assessment data? It really is the same kind of material. So when you're studying from here on out, regardless of the class you're in, really think safety and what my job is. All right. What did your teacher say about the different stages, uh, phases of burns? Did they talk about that at all? Like the emergent, the acute? Yeah, this, this book has three, but the uh, NCLEX book, they throw an extra one in their resuscitation oh, yeah. phase. And this one does have resuscitation in here towards the bottom. It just, it's just, it, it does have resuscitation phase. It's different. I have the other book as well. So I, I'm trying to get used to this myself. Trust me. It's, yeah. it's a little bit different. I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anything, but I also don't want to go over too much since we're changing the curriculum a little bit. And that's the way NCLEX wants us to go. But do you really need to know emergent versus acute versus rehabilitation? I don't know. Um, I don't know what they want. I think resuscitative, emergent, that's just the very first part. That's that first day or two. What are we really worried about? Airway, breathing, circulation always. So when you get burned, when you come to a trauma center, this is what we're always going to do. Airway first. It's the most important thing because you die without it. Then we think about circulation and perfusion because airway and then circulation, you die. The third thing is going to be body temperature. We don't talk about this at all, but hypothermia is one of the biggest killers of somebody who is burnt because they can't regulate their body temperature and they have fluids seeping out. So now they also have that confection heat loss where the wind's blown over their wet body and it takes temperature away. So a burn center is always hot. Pain is another big thing. Before we go in there and start scrubbing down your burns and doing these things, we have to think about giving you medications. But the medication we give you has to also consider things like airway and level of consciousness. So we probably don't do a lot of opioids at first. We'll go back and look at that. So during the acute phase, right? I mean, during the emergent phase, that's that first 24 hours. This is where fluid resuscitation also starts becoming very important because what we're trying to do support circulating perfusion. So this is where your book doesn't talk about the parking lung formula at all anymore, right? I haven't seen it in the book at all. So 
For me, let's talk about it. How do you know that you're maintaining somebody's circulation? Your book does mention fluid resuscitation is provided at a rate needed to maintain urine output of what? 30 to 50 mLs per hour or 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour. So this is what we do in every burn center. While we use the Parkland formula, yes, to ensure that we're giving them the right amount of fluid because it's usually like 14,000 um, mLs. Like we're going to give 14 liters in 24 hours, seven in the first eight hours when we think of Parkland. I'll get there in a minute. But how do I know I'm perfusing you correctly? Because your urine output is 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour. Don't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if you had to figure one of these out on an exam, right? Just like the Parkland formula or just like any other kind of medication question. Be aware of these numbers. They always show up somewhere. I don't know if it's 30 to 50, but for me, I can do 0.5 mLs per kilogram and I can figure what that looks like. So um, be aware of that. I also put down here, Parkland formula. The Parkland formula, when we think about a patient who is burned, you come in and we do all of your total body surface area. We're going to do a formula and it takes um, your kilograms in weight times four mLs. That's just what the Parkland formula uh, uses times your total body surface. If you look here in my notes, you can see this, correct? So I gave you an example. You have a patient who weighs, no, maybe I didn't give you one. Yeah, I did. For four mLs, your patient weighs 70 kilograms times what? 0.5%. So is it 0.5 or is it 50%? I want you to do the math. I did this on purpose. So let's that's, pull the back. Yeah, it's 50%. So, and I like to do that way on purpose. So let, let's look at the, cal I, I'll do the calculator. If I do four times 70 times 0.5, what does that equal? 140. Is that really what we want to do there? Probably not, right? So I did that on purpose just to let you see, because I don't want you screwing it up on an exam times 50%, right? What does that give us? 14,000. I don't know if you can see my calculator or not. So when you do it that way, and it's 50%, I want you to write in 50% on purpose so you don't screw that up on an exam if that were truly something you had. Just do 50, not percent, just 50, right? And that would give you 14,000. What we know about this is half of that volume in a real trauma center or a real burn center, you're going to get the first half of that volume over eight hours. So you're literally going to set a pump at 7,000 mLs for eight hours. It's ridiculous. It's a lot of fluid, but your third spacing so much that we can't maintain this. Make sure that your urine output is matching up because this is a suggestion. This is real life. That's why we don't do Parkland near as much as we used to. And we go to this instead. All right. Um, what else? Full thickness, assess the quality. I talked about that already. I just I want to make sure I keep saying the things that I know the book misses out on a lot. All right. And then the last part is that uh, restorative rehabilitation. There's not much you're going to do with that because that's after they've done everything and they start going home. So I don't really mess with that so much. That seems like a real Burns nurse. All right. So let's get into assessment. What are we trying to assess? I can't say I can't say it enough. I can't say it loud enough. Look airway, at breathing, circulation. Well, airway, breathing, circulation, yes. I'll <laughs> never say that enough. But when you're looking at assessment, think about, once again, the circumstances surrounding the burn so you can focus on airway, breathing, circulation. Once again, if it's an inhalation burn, if it was a house fire, if it was a car wreck that rolled over, you don't know, maybe it caught on fire, maybe there was smoke. I don't know, nor do I care. If you're in a closed car that wrecked, mm, I'm going to go to the side of caution. I'm not going to let you die on my watch. You can die somewhere else, just not on my watch. So think about that. Assess, like I said, for singed eyelashes, audible wheezes, when they exhale, think about any history of car or house fire. Then get a weight and a height so you can start thinking about the Parkland formula. You can start thinking about the urine output, right? If you don't remember the urine output, I want you to make sure you remember that. It's 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour. Those matter. So it's going to be important that you understand that. Remember that the rate of complications from a burn increase as you get older, because older people have thinner skin, they have slower healing time. So if we go down here and we know this about this people, if you get a test question, AKA you walk into a patient's room and they're 60, 70 years old and they have you know burned somewhere else, that puts them at risk. It puts them at higher risk for more stuff. So increased age, it might require some interdisciplinary type care. You might need to get some other collaboration on this patient because of the 
slower healing times. It might take them longer to return back to some kind of functional ADL. That sounds like nursing stuff, doesn't it? It just does. All right. Um, here's my big one. Respiratory assessment. Y'all have to be in the respiratory. Even if you think a burn to the skin is minor, look at the mouth, look at the nose, look at the eyebrows, look at the mustache, look for any hair. Um, listen, smell for smoke. You know what I'm talking about. You can smell that, that smoke like a campfire. You're like, well, what is that? You kind of stink. It's okay. Your breath. It is okay. Upper airway edema is most pronounced eight to 12 hours after the fluid resuscitation begins. So they're going to get there with us. And then we're going to start doing what? We're going to start replacing their fluid volume loss at like a thousand mLs an hour. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to go into some kind of, maybe not fluid volume overload. They won't, but they will get that edema, that shifting. It's going to become worsened. This is the patient we really have to listen. Even after they've been there, if they start drooling, if they're having difficulty swallowing, if they're coughing, wheezing, you hear that strider, y'all, this might be the time to call rapid response so we can drop an ET tube in them. It even says it down here, critical rescue. If for whatever reason, that hoarseness, that brassy cough, they start drooling, the swallowing difficulties, any kinds of audible sound, strider, whatever, call rapid response because they're going to die if you don't intubate them shortly. Your book, look, look how many times your book mentions that. Wheezes, partial obstruction of gas exchange, patients with intubation injury. I mean, inhalation injury required what? Rapid obstruction within the short period of time, narrowed airways, wheezing disappears. What's that mean? You no longer have an airway. It's obstructed. Now we're not going to be able to get any kind of airway down you. So I just want to make that abundantly clear that these people are going to have obstructions very quickly. And early intubation is the only thing that's going to stop that airway closure completely. I know it sounds weird, but that is what's going to kill your patient fastest. I always love to talk about pulmonary edema. What is pulmonary edema again? Oops, uh, fluids in your lungs. That's all it is, y'all. Pulmonary edema is just that I have inflammation inside my lungs. What part of the lung are we talking about specifically? We're more worried about the alveolar spaces, right? Because as fluid builds, it starts to fill those spaces and we no longer get gas exchange. It is the same, same. So elevating the head of the bed to at least 45 degrees, starting supplemental O2, letting somebody know your patient's starting to crash is all you can do initially. But make sure you do whatever you can. Any questions on that? I think it's pretty self-explanatory and straightforward. All right. Um, skin assessment, we, we've already done this. The extent and depth of the burn is really what you're going to look for. Know that, go back and look at the top part. If it's above a certain percentage of, of partial or deep thickness, those go straight to the ER and to the, and to the burn center. Your TBA, like I said, a burn that involves 40% of your total body surface area is a 40% burn. Your outlook is not good with a 40% burn. It is very, very hard to stay alive if you don't get the right treatment right away. I don't think I'm getting the carbon monoxide poisoning any more than this, y'all. I mean, you can look at this if you'd like. I doubt your teacher got into this much more in class, correct? If all, at all? No, no, she didn't. She, she just said about the cherry look. If you got too much of that, you'll see like really bright cherry on their skin. Yeah, you will. And I, I, I can tell you right here, I want you to understand that carbon dioxide transported across lung membrane tightly binds to hemoglobin in place of oxygen. It literally... So you can give them high flow oxygen. They still can't breathe. You know what we have to do to them? Take them to like here in San Antonio, we have a place called Warm Springs and they have bariatric chambers Well, they will actually take them and, and they'll press the, the, the oxygen through their body into the tissue to kick off the um, uh, carbon uh, monoxide to replace it with oxygen. It is crazy how hard it is. So when these patients are, man, they are just problematic altogether. So that vasodilation caused by the carbon monoxide is what causes that cherry red color in patients. And I always say that a cherry red color in the face, you can look at their oral mucosa, depending on their skin tone. If you have more melanin, it's harder to tell if you have that cherry red mucosa, right? Um, but if, if you're looking at the, at the oral mucosa, sometimes it's more prevalent. I'm not telling you where to look. I just want you to be aware you got to look somewhere. All right. So non-surgical, we're not getting into the escharotomies and stuff anymore like we used to, but what's it say? Interventions for the patient receiving burn care, airway maintenance, pain control, infection control, and wound healing. So these are going to pop up on you. 
I'll say the same thing again and again. I, I hate when I don't do stuff correctly. I got to fix that. It's going to drive me crazy. There we go. So what is your first action for a burn to the chest or the face? Make sure you're thinking about Oxygen. airway. This is the first step. Set them up 45 degrees if you have to. Slap on nasal cannula, right? Do what you can. Pain control, the first thing we're going to do is medicate the patient before we start scrubbing, right? So it says pain medication is tailored to the patient's level, the coping mechanisms. Medication at least 30 minutes ahead of time gives them the best results. Not 20 minutes, not 50. You really have to plan ahead. If you don't give your patients what they need, it is torture. If you've never been there, they literally scrub dead tissue off of people. It is not pleasant. It smells to high heaven and it's super painful. So your job is to pain control, right? So we think about these, a lot of these po people are gonna be ambulatory basis. So ibuprofen and acetamine might be adequate, but we might also have to go to opioids. Just be aware, um, typically not in the first setting. Teach the patient that, um, Contact a primary health care physician. If they have infections, like what is an infection? Look for increased areas of redness. Thinks about warmth to touch, purulent drainage. I always tell my patient, look for that edema. If the edema starts to swell outside of where the skin was burned, that could be a sign and symptom of infection, right? How do we know we have an infection on our arm typically? It starts to get red, erythema. What happens if your skin's burned? It looks exactly the same. So that's why I always instruct my patient right over here. Watch for that development. If the redness and the edema starts to go outside the original area of the burn, that's starting to grow. That might be a sign and symptom of infection. At least that's what I always teach because it's true. Um, be, just be aware of that kind of stuff. Compression dressing is the last thing I'm going to talk about in here. When you get those severe burns, they're going to give you a compression dressing. I know you've seen people like this after burns, right? Where they have the gloves on with the fingers out. They have the face thing on as well. It does multiple things. Um, it helps with lymphatic drainage, right? So these garments, uh, they're supposed to do what? Inhibit venous stasis by doing exactly what we do with anybody who has bad venous return. We put on compression stockings. We put on SCDs to squeeze the venous return back up, the lymphatic drainage. That's what these compression devices do. So they have to put on. And they're worn for like 23 hours a day over their dressing like all freaking day. You can take it off the bathe and stuff, but you need that compression. We see this with all kinds of stuff though. Any kind of fluid shifts, we'll see these, even in post-op surgeries for like all kinds of stuff. But know for your patients who are in burns, these are important and have to be worn all day. That's it. That's all I'm gonna cover on burns, uh, unless you have specific questions and which I'll pause real quick. Give me one second. All right, so now we're going to be on chapter 34, and we're going to go over caring of patients with shock. I want to start, like I always say to everybody I've ever talked to, shock is shock is shock. All shock's the same in this, in this point only. What shock say? Widespread abnormal cellular metabolism occurring when oxygenation and tissue perfusion needs do not maintain cell function. So shock just means your organs are not being perfused. What happens when your organs aren't perfused? What happens to the organ? They can die. It, yeah, it starts to fail. And we know that the body has some very sensitive things like our brain, our kidneys. Y'all, anytime we go into shock, one of the first things we notice is that kidney failure. Like your kidney is one of the most very peculiar things. So we start looking at decreased urine outputs and things like that. So I'm going to start every single session the same way. This book says your priority concepts are perfusion and infection. It just makes sense. We're talking about shock, and we know that septic shock is in there somewhere. So perfusion, what's shock? A lack of perfusion. That's all shock is. Perfusion, this exemplar, hypovolemic shock. Infection, septic shock. So we're going to talk about that. There's also clotting, gas exchange, and immunity. This chapter doesn't really talk about clotting too much, so we're going to look at that DIC later. Um, but clotting does what? If I have a clot and I don't get blood flow to the organ, what is that called? It's just shock, y'all. It's just a hypoperfusion of the organ. We could even say that about a heart attack. If somebody's having a heart attack, mild, mild cardio infarction, isn't that some kind of cardiogenic, some kind of distributive shock or, or, or um, um, maybe not distributive, 
we'll get there in a minute. It, it's a shock, right? It's a shock that's not getting fluid to the, to the heart. So it's not getting gas exchange. I know that sounds weird, but that's all shock is. Lack of perfusion to an organ. So it says it again right there. Uh, widespread lack of oxygenation. That's all this is. So any problem that impairs perfusion and gas exchange to the tissue and the organs can cause shock and life-threatening emergency. What do we care about? There are different types of shock. Um, your book says hypovolemic shock, which would just be a decreased circulating volume. Cardiogenic shock just means your heart is not working correctly for whatever reason. Your heart is not cardiogenic shock. Distributive shock. When we think about sepsis and neurogenic shock, remember on, on, on that last, on that exam, this exam, we talk about TBI as well, right? Was that last exam? This exam, yeah, that was, that was week seven. Jesus, it, it seems like it was a year ago. Um, so when we think about distributive shock, this is neurogenic shock, meaning I tell everybody the same thing. When I think of neurogenic shock and, and, and distributive shock, they're, they're weird because they're, they're not a real problem with actual blood flow. Like there's plenty of blood, the heart's working most of the time, but it's something with your, your ability to dilate or constrict your vessels. If you can't constrict your vessels, and they're just completely dilated, you have a decreased uh, 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 pressure, right? Your, your pulse pressures are decreased, so you're not perfusing the body. That's what we're talking about. So when I think about, you know, burns, we think about what? Distributive shock, because it's causing that third spacing. I talked about that over here, major burns, distributive shock. Obstructive shock means that something's obstructed. I think about what? What could be obstructed? Think about fluid around your heart. We call that a what? Cardiac tamponade. That would be a great... Uh, example of obstructive shock. The heart can't beat, or it can, now it just can't repolarize. So it's obstructed. And just things for you to think about. So I had to go from top to bottom and skip this box here real quick so we could kind of look at it. But the box it refers to is the key features. I'm a huge fan of these key features. Shock. I, it just, this is not talking about any specific kind of shock. It's saying any of these four shocks is going to cause problems with cardio, uh, cardiovascular. If you're not perfusing your brain, what's your brain going to make your, your heart do? Increase the pulse rate. What's it going to make your respiratory rate do? Go up. If I don't have enough circulating volume, what happens to my blood pressure? It goes down. So almost overwhelmingly, almost overwhelmingly for all shocks, for the majority of shocks, you're going to have hypotension, right? Tachycardia and tachypnea. I can't spell, so it don't matter. If y'all don't like my spelling, it's okay. But that's typical of majority of shocks. That is not the case when we get down to like neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is almost the opposite of this. If you go back and watch that ex ex lecture, it's more of a hypertensive crisis and bradycardia and widening pulse pressures. Whereas in most other shocks, it's hypotension, it's tachycardia because you're trying to compensate, it's tachypnea because you're trying to compensate. And you have narrowing pulse pressures because you're hypotensive. You don't have enough volume. And I'm going to show you some really cool things in here because I want you to really understand this and not just memorize it. So let me go ahead. Let me go ahead. I'm going to leave that there, but I have to clear that. But that's what I want you to understand. It's all the same, y'all. Shock is shock is shock. Mr. Stratton doesn't care about shock. I don't. It's all caused by the same stuff. Except for like septic shock and neuro. There's a couple things I care about. So make sure you think about what, what happens. I already told you shock causes a lack of perfusion to organs. I already said your brain is very sensitive. So early signs will be what? Anxiety, restlessness, increased thirst. I don't think, if you don't understand increased thirst, as you get dehydrated, these baroreceptors start getting activated. Your book talks about it. And you start having this thirst. Your body's like, bro, we are dehydrated. We need to drink something. That's what it does. As we keep getting a little further down, there's other stuff, but I want you to think about your kidneys. Decrease urine output. What does happen every time you're in fluid volume deficit, every time you have dehydration, we call that an acute kidney injury because you're not perfusing your kidneys. Late sign eventually, but if you know you're having kidney problems, now you also know you have electrolyte imbalances like having too much what? Potassium. These things just go hand in hand. If you learn it once, you never have to memorize it again. When you know what the kidneys do and you understand that a lack of blood flow is going to screw your kidney, it all presents the same. You don't have to really go out there and start thinking about what your, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stop sharing. Let me go ahead and share again. 
Not sure what happened there. Well, I do know I hit the button on accident. So, <laughs> but that's what I mean. When you start really looking at the body as a system and you quit trying to memorize signs and symptoms for, you know, a test, it's never going to help you. I mean, it helps a little bit, but this is what we're saying. If you understand what shock is, you don't have to memorize anything. Shock is shock is shock. Your body's always going to compensate. Your body compensates until it can't. Eventually, it can't uh, get the kidneys enough oxygen, so they start to fail, and you start having to decrease urine output. That's why we tell our, 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 our patients, hey, make sure you tell the doctor if you're not peeing as much. That's it. So go back and really look at some of those things. That they become very fascinating, and you start realizing, I'm way smarter than I thought I was. I don't have to memorize. I got this. I'm a nurse. Yeah. All right, so as we keep pushing on here, if we think about review of gas exchange and tissue perfusion, this is my favorite equation, Nor you've heard this 17 times already. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Why do I tell you that? Because it doesn't matter what you're talking about in any nursing class, on any exam, on any patient, y'all. If their heart is not doing their job correctly, it is caused by either the heart rate's too slow or the stroke volume. A heart attack, a myocardial infarction will cause your tissue to die so it doesn't squeeze as hard. It might also screw up your left and right bundle branches so your heart rate. My point being is y'all understand that. You understand compensatory mechanisms when you have a heart attack. What I want you to understand, it doesn't matter what's causing you not to have enough perfusion. Cardiac output is always heart rate times stroke volume. And if I have decreased volume, right, right here, decreased blood pressure, I have to have an increased heart rate. My body says so. So if you know that kind of stuff, it just makes sense. All right. So total body volume and cardiac output is directly related to MAP. I'm, I, your test is not going to get this in depth, I don't believe, ever. But it helps you understand that when you have a decrease in total blood volume or cardiac output, you have a lower MAP. And what is a MAP? When blood vessels dilate, the total blood volume remains the same, right? When they dilate, the volume is the same. But what happens to the pressure? It decreases because there's no pressure pushing it through. Blood pressure decreases, blood flow is slower. Y'all, that is what we're gonna call like that, 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 that distributive type shock. When, when the blood vessel starts to dilate, it decreases your mean arterial pressure. So septic shock leads to narrowing pulse pressures. Once you, memorize, once you understand how it works, it's not near as complicated, right? To figure out what you're gonna see on a patient. That's why we have a lack of volume I have a lack of pressure, I'm going to have a decreased MAP. Whereas in neurogenic shock, I have hypertension, I'm going to have what? Think about the, 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 the wide impulse pressure because the pressure starts to go up. Now my systolic is 170 over something, is further apart. Yeah, you don't have to memorize that now. Now you know. And like G.I. Joe said, no one is half the back. All right, so make sure your patient keeps their MAP. Make sure your patient keeps their MAP. They, they have no choice on this. You as a nurse... Make sure when you're looking at MAP, what is a normal MAP? If a normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, a normal MAP is about 40. So we want to keep our MAP above 40. So sometimes we need to keep it. If we have widening pulse pressures or narrowing pulse pressures, we're trying to see what it is. So, you know, how do I know that what I'm doing for the patient who is in um, some kind of shock here and their MAP is narrow, they're in hypovolemic shock or something, and they have a, 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 a narrowing pulse pressure, I know I got to, if I give them fluid replacement and I keep their, their map above 40, 50, 60, something like that, it's like, okay, we did right by the patient. That makes sense on every level, hopefully. Yeah, I don't know sure if you're teaching does. that or not, but that's more of a patho lesson, right? All right. Other changes, other organs. So like, you know, when, when you're, you know how the body works. If you get chased by a bear, your sympath sympathetic nervous system diverts all of your blood flow where? Straight to your core. Your fingers, your hands, they don't die. They get cold and diaphoretic. But your, your skin and your extremities, they're not really all that sensitive. Skeletal muscle, they can be lower oxygenation, but not your heart, not your brain, not your liver, not your pancreas, not your kidney. Y'all, these things are very sensitive. And this is where you'll start seeing these first sudden changes in your patient. All right. So here are your four types of shock. Hypovolemic, cardiogenic, distributive shock, anaphylactic shock, and they say sepsis. So I say four types of shock. There's more apparently according to your book, but not really to me because some of them are kind of the same, right? If we go back up, 
distributive shock, anaphylaxis. They kind of they can kind of go together sometimes. But let's just look at hypovolemia. What causes hypovolemia shock? A lack of blood flow. Circul it says too little circulating blood. If we don't have enough blood, it decreases MAP. I'm just going to keep saying this over because I really want you to understand MAP. You are ICU patient nurses now, right? This is an ICU type, type of class. I need you to understand what a MAP is. So if we don't have good ar mean arterial pressure, meaning that we don't have good, you know, good pressure within our, in, in our vessels to perfuse, what do we have? A lack of perfusion. So when I think about hypovolemic shock, dehydration, it could be poor clotting with hemorrhages, right? Common problems leading to hypovolemic shock are dehydration, lack of fluid, or poor clotting if I, with hemorrhaging, right? If I can't clot and I'm on some kind of medication that causes me to bleed more, I'm going to bleed out and be hypovolemic. So don't be, don't be surprised when you see questions that have patients on Coumadin or something like that. Your job as a nurse, especially as a nursing student, on an exam is to pay attention to these little nuances. Ah, the patient's on the, they're, they're, I don't know. I don't know how they could present that. They could do something tricky and say that their INR, you know, they're, they're, is whatever, right? That they're- They could even be on like aspirin, that. no? Whatever that is, exactly. It's your job as a nurse, because when you walk into one of my kids' room, it is your job as a nurse to say, oh, they're on some kind of heparin. Hmm, let me check what? Let me check for anything that might be, I say this, monitor for patients for uh, development of chest discomfort. If I don't have enough fluid volume going around, my heart's going to be working harder. and It's not going to resupply blood to itself. It's going to be air hunger. I just want you all to think about that. Cardiogenic shock, especially somebody who has an acute myocardial infarction. What, what happens to your cardiac output? Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. If my muscle, the myocardial tissue dies, is it squeezing as hard? Absolutely not. So stroke volume is down. If stroke volume is down, cardiogenic shock. We're just not perfusing. A lot of times we'll give dobutamine. Um, it's prescribed to increase myocardial contractions. Y'all know what dobutamine is, right? So that's the kind of medication we give to kind of work with the heart. We see that all the time with any kind of heart failure. I, I, know, I know what words y'all like to talk about. We, we see digoxin, right? Y'all like digoxin. It causes ventricular contraction as well. But dobutamine is one that we, we use quite often in cardiogenic shock. Out of vasopressor? Yeah, so that's what we always talk about, vasopressin. We, we can cause the, the, the vessels to constrict and cause the pressure to go up. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all are getting it, right? There's only so much we can do on our level before the patient's going to die. Somebody else can have to do something. They have to do surgery, prescribe medications. If you know what your job is, you'll pass every test you ever take. I'm not saying you're going to 100, but you'll pass with a 74 or better. What more do you need to graduate? Nothing. So good to go. All right, distributive shock is one that we have talked about. I, I'm, I know we're stuck on this one page, but this book does not do a great job of just kind of spreading them out. So I hit where I could hit. Um, well, like I said, with distributive shock, this is the one we're saying your blood vessel dilation, pulling the blood. So we're thinking about venous stasis as well. These are kind of that stuff. What, what's happening? Um, all these factors decrease what? The map. If I'm not distributing, so I don't have a good volume. I will have a decreased map, less than 40. I'll have that narrowing pulse pressures again. It's just what we, that's what we know. Um, septic shock is the most common form of distributive shock. I mentioned that more than once, but I want you to understand that. When we get down there to sepsis in a little while, I'm going to explain it a little bit more. All right. Oh, what else can we talk about here? Oh, my goodness. What did I say? Um, oh, anaphylaxis. If your airway stops and closes off, what happens to your blood volume? You don't have, I mean, nothing. Blood volume is still good. What happens to your heart? Does it still work? Sure. What are you lacking? Oxygen. That's all it is. But also when you have anaphylaxis, guess what else happens? A widespread loss of blood vessel tone, meaning you decrease blood pressure and cardiac output. So it's not just anaphylaxis is causing your throat to close down. It's literally causing what? Decreased blood pressure and vessel tone. It's causing you to have that dilating effect. Distributed I was shock. told that anaphylaxis would be covered on next exam, not this exam for some oh. reason. Well, good. Anaphylaxis is still distributive shock. So it's a lack of blood flow and oxygen to the organs. Good to go. We can skip that, but at least now you know. What I can tell you is the same thing. When, when you have somebody in a uh, hypovolemic shock or you have somebody in distributive shock, what are we trying to do? Hypovolemic shock, we're trying to stop the bleeding, stop the blood loss, correct the clotting disorder 
and then replace volume. That's all we can do, right? With distributive shock, we're talking about fluid is shift from your vascular space. We call this third spacing. That's the problem. So um, what can we do? Think about risk factors that cause, what, what does this? Injuries, head traumas. We just talked about that, right? Neurogenic shock. It's the opposite of everything else. So uh, anaphylaxis can cause that. Sepsis, capillary leak. We're talking about we're losing blood volume. That's all distributive shock is. That's all that sepsis is. It's that lack uh, of pressure through whatever, capillary leaks, burns. What happens to burns? Your third space, you lose the central volume. It start making sense, right? Liver impairment. What does the liver do? We think about volume and how the liver, it, it all starts making sense. So what can we do? Decrease the workload of the heart. Elevate the head of the bed, right? I mean, not the head of the bed. Uh, elevate the feet. Keep the head of the bed lower. What does that cause? It causes blood flow back to your vital organs like a recovery position or a reverse Tentrellenburg, whatever you want to call that. Not recovery, but reverse Tentrellenburg. Recovery would be more on your side. Um, but just, y'all know this. Give blood volume, give fluid, give O2, whatever you can do to help that. My last thing is right here, distributive shock. I talked about this earlier, cardiac tamponade. If I can't distribute the fluid because the heart can't beat anymore, that could be a specific part. So distributive shock is often caused by that cardiac tamponade. Here's some cool pictures. If you don't understand what we're talking about, this is a dilate. This is a dilated blood pressure, like right, right. This is normal. This would be dilated. The blood volume is still there, but the pressure goes down because there's no pressure in there. It's like a. It's like not having. You've been in, you've been in a shower that has poor water pressure. It just comes out limp and gross. It doesn't do anything on your head. It keeps all the, the shampoo in there. If you have one of those ones that have high pressure, it shoots out and punches in the eye and feel like you're going to lose your eyesight, right? So it's kind of the same thing. We want to be normal tensive, but you don't have to read that. I just want you to be aware of it. All right. The last, uh, the sepsis, also part of your distributive shock, right? Anaphylaxis and sepsis fall underneath distributive shock. Sepsis, we're going to get down there in a little while, but what does it cause? Dysregulation response by infection. So what does that tell you? There has to be some kind of infection present for us to think about sepsis. Y'all get that in class, right? They talk about that sepsis protocol. What do they always say? What's the first thing they have in a sepsis protocol? Some kind of known source of infection typically, right? A UTI, a, a upper respiratory yeah. infection. Uh, they have a decubitus ulcer, a stage three ulcer. Any of those things put you at risk for sepsis. Septic shock is when your circulatory, cellular, and metabolic abnormalities start to cause uh, increased risk for death because you're no longer perfusing your organs. If we can't perfuse your organs, you will die of multiple system organ failure. Obstructive shock, I just told you, obstructive shock is a cardiac tamponade. It, it can't beat anymore, it's obstructed. It can no longer um, pop back. I might've misspoke earlier and, and said distributive in my head and that's not what I meant. When we think obstructed, what happens? The cardiac tamponade puts all that pressure on the pericardial sac. It causes the heart, when the heart depolarizes and squeezes, now it's obstructed. It can no longer repolarize and get more blood flow out. That's how I think. Wouldn't, it. wouldn't pneumothorax be part of that too? It could. Attention yes, pneumothorax. Pressure. I would say that, yeah. Any pressure that causes the, there's nothing wrong with the heart. We're just saying, oh, there's pressure in there, especially attention pneumothorax that keeps pressing and pressing and pressing. Absolutely. Great point. That's a great point. Appreciate that. All right. So hypovolemic shock, we've talked about this a little bit. What is it? It's a lack of volume resulting in, in decreased MAP. Um, monitor the patient for the quality and the rate of their pulses. It's going to let you know if they, if they have good bounding pulses that are bilateral and equal. You're like, oh, we have a good MAP. If you get those weak, thready pulses, it means you have a decreased mean arterial pressure, meaning you have decreased blood pressure, right? because it's, you got 90 over 50, is that not, or 90 over 80, it's starting to get smaller and smaller. If you don't understand it, go back and look at this path though. I thought it was, you mentioned it earlier, a decrease in MAP of five to 10 millimeters of mercury from their normal baseline is problematic, right? It's detected by pressure sensitive nerves, your baroreceptors, right? In your aortic, uh, in your aortic arch, your, your carotid sinuses, they all start to do something. When they feel that, they have this compensatory mechanism that continues that blood flow and that oxygen delivery. So blood, blood movement, the movement of blood in these areas can be bypassed. Like you said, shunting. It's like, nope, we don't need to go here. Let's go straight to the organs. And it goes to the main organs first, like your brain and your heart. So kidneys will be failing way before your brain or your heart do unless they have a clotting problem. But I just want you to understand that. 
what it looks like. So make sure you know what you're monitoring for. Um, they can be temporary and reversible if corrected within one to two hours. That's important for you to understand. That's because if you're not in there really assessing your patient like you should, you put their life at risk, right? How? Because these problems end up with multiple organ dysfunction. They call that MODs, right? Y'all have heard those in class, MODs and SIRS, which is your, go back, we'll look at sepsis in a minute um, when you think of septic shock, but we're just talking about multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Your organs are going to fail and you're going to die. So we'll just leave it at that. Hypovolemia, what do you do in the first part? What do you have to worry about? In the initial stages of everything, you have early signs and symptoms, which would be your increased heart rate. We know that. And the compensatory phase, your body's trying to do something. So you get this renin and the aldosterone, the antidiuretic hormones, right? Your adrenal yeah. gland is going to start saying, hey, man, right? Uh, uh, it's going to start doing stuff. And then what else? Your anterior pituitary gland is going to be like, bro, we need some antidiuretic hormones. Our blood pressure is way, way low. So let's reduce. I mean, let's, let's secrete more antidiuretic hormones. Y'all see how all this stuff goes together? You don't learn one body system. It's all perfusion. What goes wrong to one will kill something else. So as long as you understand that circle of life, if you will, it starts making sense. Decrease your output. Oh, yeah. Why? Well, what does, what does increased antidiuretic hormone cause? A decreased urine output. Also, what does hypovolemia cause? Maybe acute kidney injury. So that can also decrease urinary output. I'm not saying initially, but at some point it will, because as you get down here later on in your progressive stages, we start getting metabolism because ana ana uh, anaerobic, we start getting a buildup of um, acid, right? We get tissue ischemia, we get hyperkalemia, also due to what? Kidney failure as well. It starts to pop up. It starts making sense when you understand how the body works. You don't have to memorize everything. You're just like, ah, the body works this way. That's what I'm trying to convey to y'all. And then towards the end, you just, you start dying. Really, you go into multiple system organ failure and you die. So it's important that we are out there on top of stuff. What can we do? What are we talking about? Go back and read this if you have any questions on how, how the MAP triggers the renin and, and, and the aldosterone and, and the ADH and epi, all of your catecholamines, your epi and norepi, right? To start what? The kidney compensation. That's what your body's like, hey, we don't got enough volume. It's cool when those barrel receptors start to feel that your pressure is getting too low. It starts releasing stuff. Everything your body does is compensatory. So when we think about signs and symptoms, it's typically saying, ah, your body doesn't do this normally. It does it in response to what? Hypovolemia. Man, it blew my mind when I finally put that. It wasn't nursing school when I put that together. It wasn't. It was years later when I started teaching nursing school and read the book with intent. I was like, holy crap, what have I been doing the last 10 years before I turn out to do this? Like, it really is. So your output decreases. It needs to. Sodium reabsorption increases. So you're going to have hypernatremia because you're going to try to bring fluid back in. Widespread blood vessel constriction occurs, which is decrease, uh, 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 decrease uh, uh, um, oxygenation and energy to your, your organs. It starts making sense on why things start to break down. All right, so I won't keep going on that, but I want you to be aware of how the acid doses happens and the low pH, because you never know what you're going to see on an exam. All right. Um, objective changes include exactly what you think they would. Restlessness, because they're not perfusing the brain. Tachycardia, we've already talked about. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. It just has to make sense. Tachypnea, we know why. Decreased urine output, we just talked about it. You don't have to memorize. Narrowing pulse pressures, because we don't have good blood pressure. It just starts making sense. All right, so that's shock in a nutshell. But what are we going to do about it? What can we think about? Identify the patients who are at risk for dehydration and early signs and symptoms of that because it's going to lead to what? Kidney, uh, acute kidney injury is going to lead to that volume to go down. It's going to cause that, that narrowing pulse pressures, which, which in turn is going to cause the baroreceptors to start reducing reduce catecholamines and epinephrine, I mean, epinephrine and uh, ADH and everything else is going to cause this. It's just cool, right? All right. What else? Compare urine output and fluid intake. Are your eyes and nose mount, 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 matching up? If they don't, that's a good indication that your urine output is not happening. If they're excessively thirsty and they keep drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking and their urine output is not increasing, oh, that might be, a, that might be problematic. That's why we do this stupid assessment that everybody hates to do because it's really not stupid. 
It's my kids. It also sounds kids. like diabetes and syphilis. It's all the same. It's the same stuff. Because what is diabetes and syphilis? And what is SIDH? It is your uh, antidiuretic hormone kicking in. So a lot of these things are very much related. A yeah. As your adrenal glands start thinking about, uh, you know, whatever, and as your anterior pituitary starts doing whatever, as our albumin starts being released and everything else, it causes the same effect. Yeah, you're 100% right. All right. Mm, information about urine, especially important because it's the first signs and symptoms, often the shock. When fluid intake is normal, think about that. All right. And then right here, it says a trend is indicated when all or any or all of the vital signs or other assessment findings go up or down in a period of one to four hours, right? So we're saying, why do we check vital signs every four hours? Because a trend is when something goes up or down in that time frame. If your patient's more uh, acutely ill, ICU, we usually go to one hour. We don't just make this stuff up. If you've ever wondered why we do it every four hours, because typically we can see a trend. Our body, this is best practice. So there you go. All right. Um, think about this. Uh, think about this safety. I highlighted this whole thing because I really wanted you to understand. This is a, a prime example of a delegation question, right? It says, assign a registered nurse rather than a licensed practical nurse or a UAP, an unassisted and unlicensed assisted personnel, to assess vital signs on a patient suspected of having hypovolemic shock. Why? What is the first rule in delegation? If you don't know, I'm going to tell you what it is right now. You have to assess your patient first for stability before you can ever delegate anything because what's it require? Nursing judgment. And what can you never delegate? Nursing judgment. It's saying right here, it requires the brain of a registered nurse. And I'm not knocking any LVNs out there. I'm just not. This is the way it works. Y'all went to school a lot longer than you did for LVN school if you're an LVN already. So you already know this. You can't delegate stuff on patients who aren't stable and if you didn't check the vital signs on a patient who is hypovolemic, they are not stable. It requires nursing judgment. I just want you to know that's a, that's a registered nurse scope of practice. So think about those. All right. Uh, cardiovascular changes, you should already know this. Increase heart rate, tachycardia. As shock progresses, peripheral pulses become not palatable. Why? Because we get basal constriction and we get shunting to the organs. It just starts making sense. I'm a level one trauma guy. So all I've done my whole life, I get trauma. Diabetes, eh, everybody in the Navy didn't have diabetes. So that it took me a lot to go back and figure that out. People are dying and getting burned and going into shock. Your boy got that. Like I understand it. So vasoconstriction, diastolic pressure increases, right? But systolic pressure remains the same. When we think about vasoconstriction, this is what we're talking about with those pulse pressures. That's what a narrowing pulse pressure is. When you think about vasoconstriction, it just causes your systolic pressure to go up. And that is what we're talking about, or, or it causes it to go down. It just depends on what we're talking about. So a reduced systolic pressure narrows, and increased systolic pressure widens. It's crazy. All right. Um, oxygen saturation, y'all know what that looks like. What's it say here? Any value less than 70% is life-threatening, and pretty much that means they're in the late stages of shock. So if you're looking at patients, and you're wondering who I see first, Y'all already know 70% is what you need to look at. And you know why? It's because they're in shock and they're not perfusing their brain. And what do we have to do? Respiratory rate increases during shock, during certain oxygen. You understand all of these type of things, right? You finally understand. I know you have already. But these are those compensatory mechanisms. Decreased urine output. Less than 30 an hour. Or what's it say there? 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour. It doesn't matter if we're talking about burns or anything else. The body has to have enough fluid to produce a, to micturate enough to say that we are perfusing them correctly. The kidneys have to be hydrated enough to say they're being perfused correctly. It depends on the patient. They might need more fluid. They might need less. It all depends. But when you think about it, decreased urine is absolutely an indicator of early shock. So look at the, eye, the eyes and nose hourly. Uh, look for any kind of severe shock, no urine output at all. So I put it over here again, decrease urine output, less than 30 mLs. I just have to keep saying it. Measure the urine output hourly. Um, make sure you're looking to see if they have it. It is the small details that we're always going to test you on because that's what we need to do here. All right. Central nervous system, what are we looking for? Just changes in cognition. A lot of times level of consciousness. But what are we over missing? Shock. The first manifestation in central like, is, is thirst, especially when we're thinking about uh, hypovolemic shock. They don't have enough volume. 
Why? Because the thirst centers, they understand that decreased volume. Think about pressure, the barrel receptors. It's the same crap. You don't have to think about it over and over again. If you learn it once, it applies everywhere throughout the body for the most part. So that's shock in a nutshell. And the last part we're going to go over on shock is septic shock. So how is septic shock different? Well, septic shock is different in that you have to understand what causes it, which is typically some kind of uh, infection. Infection. Yeah. What, what, did your, what did your teacher say in class about the um, shock, uh, 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 protocol for sepsis protocol? What did they mention? I personally haven't covered septic shock myself, and that's okay. what I'm going to go over tonight. You because, like I said, oh, no worries. Do you so remember what they said? Our, our teacher was looking into um, that the 10 edition doesn't truly cover uh, septic yeah. shock. They're all more into. Uh, it does if you it yeah. does if you know how to do it, but yes, it's not near as it used to be. I, I do remember that she briefly discussed that there's like a bundle uh for management like a one hour bundle uh protocol so yeah. it to, so yeah. it has to be two it has to meet two of the signs and symptoms and you have to do it them you have to do interventions in an hour yeah yeah exactly so i'm, I'm gonna get in that and, and we're gonna go through this first and then i can tell you why because i almost got fired once before um not doing i didn't understand septic shock and i, I was in the er and it, it wasn't my patient i took over but it doesn't matter what your excuse is. If you kill somebody, you kill somebody. This was for early on in my career, right? So sepsis, we talk about an infection. So that's the first thing. There's typically some source of infection, right? But we know when you get septic shock, you're at a much higher risk of death. Septic shock is associated with that systemic inflammation. Systemic inflammation response syndrome, S-I-R-S. If you understand this, the inflammatory response that is the problem, it helps you understand how we have this multiple uh, um, this organ dysfunction, right? So let's get in and think about it. Infection, 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 infection. What does infection cause? We're talking about immunity, right? I want you to look here. The, the result of this response constricts the small vessels and dilate the arteries. What happens when you do that? If you dilate the arteries, what happens to your, your pressure? If I dilate my arteries and they're wider, what happens to my systolic pressure? it starts to decrease. And my diastolic pressure stays the same. So I have a narrowing pulse pressure, which means I'm not perfusing. That's shock. Shock is shock is shock is shock is shock is shock is shock. It doesn't matter what causes it. The end result is the same. How you treat it is dependent upon the type of shock. If it's hypovolemic shock, you replace the volume. If it's you know distributive shock, you figure out how to distribute better. If it's obstructive shock, you do a pericardiosynthesis or you know whatever. So on this one, we have to first identify what the problem is. Think about what's happening. Capillary, you know, they, they, they leak, that leak of pressure. It causes the swelling and edema around, but it doesn't perfuse. So I want you to understand why sepsis is so important. Because if you're not perfusing any of your organs, you will die very fast. So um, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. That's what we're talking about. And it's triggered by uh, bacteria, but it gets widespread in your blood. So with the organism and their toxins in the bloodstream that enter the body, what happens? The inflammatory response comes in. In this case, though, it's not so good. Typically, when you have an infection that's localized, what happens? It brings in white blood cells. They go in there and kill everything, any necrotic tissue. The macrophage come in and start eating it all up, and you get this, this cell regeneration, and life is good. That's not the case when that bacterial infection becomes systemic throughout your blood, because now what happens? It causes excessive hormonal releases, uh, tissue and vascular changes. It causes this, this oxidizing stress that further impairs gas exchange and tissue perfusion. That's kind of the nutshell. It causes vasodilation and you can't any longer perfuse the organs. It's just horrible. So what your book, you're right. The book does not do a good job of talking about the bundle in here, but it says patients often has high, uh, mild hypotension low urine output, increased respiratory rate, all signs and symptoms of like a fever. But it, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't get in here real big. If you keep going, inappropriate clotting, that could also cause stuff. But I want you to look over here on the side. Your patient will typically be uh, hypotensive, meaning that they're, they're going to have severe low blood pressure. They're going to have either a fever or a lack of like really low, like you could be hypotensive where your, your temperature is like 96.8, what's normal, 98.6, right? 
when it's super low, that means your body's not going to be able to fight off infection and stuff. So hypothermia or hyperthermia, if you want to consider it that, an increased temperature or a decreased temperature. Um, tachycardia, hypotension, usually left in less than 90. I know as an ER guy, less than 90, we typically know that you're not perfusing correctly. So if you have a systolic less than 90, that's problematic. This is what we're talking about. So when my patient come into the ER, I, I told you, I wasn't a great nurse when I first graduated. My nursing school did a great job to prepare me for a lot, but I don't think I read with intent. I didn't know what I was supposed to be looking for. I was trying to memorize the whole book. So sepsis, really, and I was a, a, a new agency nurse and they put me in the ER and they gave me a patient I shouldn't have had probably, but hey, whatever. I didn't catch it. I didn't realize they did have like a UTI. That should have been my first sign and symptom. If a patient has a UTI and they have an elevated temperature or hypothermia, like less like 97, and, 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 and their blood pressure is less than 90 and they're tachycardic and maybe they have an elevated glucose level, if you think about that, what happens when you're sick? Your body starts breaking down stuff with this comorbidities. This is not, it's not unlikely to have increased um, uh, glucose as well. What do I have to do now? I have to call a sepsis alert. And the sepsis alert includes starting two large bore IVs, right? Because we're going to give them so much fluid. But before that, we're going to do what? Blood cultures from two different sites at two different times to make sure that we don't cross contaminate. And then we're going to start with some kind of broadband antibiotic. And then once the cultures get back and it's sensitive, then we will give a specific antibiotic. That is every ER I've ever worked in. That is our sepsis protocol. It, it, it varies depending on where you're at, but that's pretty much what a sepsis protocol is. You have to recognize it right away because you're going to die because distributed shock, you don't live very long. Literally, if we don't do something within an hour, we can absolutely kill somebody's loved one. And that is never acceptable. So yeah, it was that important that they came to me and talked to me and they said, if you ever miss the sepsis protocol uh, again, you'll be fired on the spot. And I was like, good to know. Guess who's never forgot that ever, as long as he's ever done everything as a nurse. You don't forget something like that because I never want to kill somebody as long as I live for any reason. So I keep th thinking about it. maintain that arterial blood pressure, you know, keep it higher I, I, above 40. I, I put this number. I was thinking about some earlier. I typically keep it high. It's okay. When you're trying to bring them up, how do you know what you're doing is working? If that map goes back up, especially into the normal area or higher, it's going to be okay for a while. That's a good turn of events. All right. Um, there's a lot. You go back and read all this. There's a lot of stuff in here. I, I, I don't have time to go over all of it. It's seven o'clock here, but I do want to talk about a few things. Conditions predisposing you to septic and septic shock. Older people, you have an infection. You have chemotherapy because that decreases your what? Immune system. Malnutrition. What do we know about malnutrition? If you don't have enough what? You can't build, you can't repair things. Immunosuppressed people, people with large wounds. I think about I do. Over here, your older patients, your patients on a feeding tube, your patient with a stage three decubitus ulcer. All We don't say your patient's malnourished. Your patient, it, 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 we say your patient's got a feeding tube. That should clue you in that they're malnourished. We don't say you have a large open wound. We just, every patient you get is going to be like a real patient. You're just looking at them and assessing them. What is my priority intervention? What do I need to do to make sure grandma doesn't die? You need to think about what you would expect to see on a chart or in the, 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 the um, buildup of a question on an exam. So just be aware of all of these. It starts making sense on what you're looking for and what kind of patients you have to identify and what you can actually do to do anything to resolve that. So like I said, go back and look at it. There's a lot of cool stuff in here um, and, and I didn't get into all of it. You can go back and look at hypovolemic shock again, risk factors. If you're on a diuretic, of course you're gonna pee out too much. What other kind of patient? Diabetes and sepsis. If you have somebody with intracranial pressure, a TBI, and they have diabetes and sepsis, that puts them at risk for what? Hypovolemic shock. How would you know they're in hypovolemic shock? The signs and symptoms. So you could very well get a, a test question that talks about a TBI and have to figure out that they're presenting with hypovolemic shock. I don't know, but those are the kind of people we're thinking about. At least Mr. Streb is when he walks into a patient's room, because I already told you, I ain't trying to kill anybody's family. Distributive shock. Just be aware. I can't go back and do everything because there's a lot of stuff, but you start getting the idea. And that's the end of this chapter. So um, that's all I have to say. I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing real quick. All right. This is the last part. And we were just talking about the DIC, which is 
disseminated intervascular coagulation. So there's actually coagulation, there's a blood clot. Um, so when we think about the blood clot, what is it doing? It's causing a lack of perfusion. But with this one, it also causes that, that fluid to start to, you wanna say third space out a little bit, right? So bleeding from many sites is the most common problem. So we'll I'm just go ahead and highlight that, right? Anywhere from oozing to, to um, actual gross hemorrhage. So the question was asked earlier, it's a clotting, but you're bleeding though. You're right. I think about it like almost as a bowel blockage, right? When I think about a, a lower bowel blockage, what people have, signs and symptoms are watery, explosive diarrhea because the pressure builds up so much behind that impacted bowel that it shoots fluid around it. This is not even remotely the same, but in my head, that's kind of what's going on with DIC. There's a clot and it's causing this pressure to build up. So it's causing it to all that kind of space out somewhere else, which is kind of weird. Um, and if you think about what the book says, what does it say? How do we, oops, so how does it treat all this? We treat it by giving heparin. That, that's, that's basically, it. you have to give heparin. Heparin, uh, the low, that low molecular weight heparin is gonna go in there and help uh, dissolve that clot. And there you go. It's right here in this section somewhere. We just saw that, um, um, so you can read here. But I want you to also understand when you're thinking about sepsis or DIC, what does it say right here? Um, that prevention of sepsis and DIC is a priority nursing intervention. So we're thinking about DIC is often caused by sepsis to kind of go hand in hand. We think about cancer. Washing hands with antimicrobial soap. Make sure you're taking your temp daily. Making sure you're bathing daily. These are things that you can talk to with patients who are, you know, maybe septic or they have a lower immune system. It's a great way of preventing this. So if prevention is our priority. Then we have to think about that patient teaching. When they actually have the DIC, now we're worried. And we're going to have to go in there and we're going to have to treat that. Um, with the heparin so we can make sure that we stop that clot and that the, the blood flow can be restored. Are there any questions on that? No. no. All right, that's all I have for this chapter. If you have any questions, make sure you refer back to your um, and teacher.